It's August 16th, 2020, and a cluster of thunderstorms emerges off the west coast of Africa. Satellites track this disorganized cluster of showers and thunderstorms as it moves over the warm waters of the Atlantic. On August 20th, a weak area of low pressure is detected. Now we're looking at a tropical depression. The next day, winds circulating around the center increase to 39 miles per hour, and tropical storm Laura is born. The storm maintains its strength as it moves through the Caribbean. Then, as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico, it gets stronger rapidly. By the 25th, it's a Cat 1 hurricane with winds of 75 miles an hour. Laura would jump past Cat 2 and Cat 3 to reach Category 4 hurricane status later that same day, eventually peaking with max winds sustained at 150 miles per hour. The storm just misses Houston to the east and devastates Lake Charles on the evening of August 26th, 2020. For a storm like that to come so close to Houston Galveston, let alone a strong Category 4 hurricane, it takes a large number of things in the atmosphere to go just right. Let's back it up, start from the beginning, and take a closer look at how a storm like that is born. Hurricane season, staying weather smart. Houston is a beautiful city, but there can be an ugly side to this slice of Texas coast, hurricanes. Tropical weather can tear off roofs, cause our bayous to rise and bring down several inches of rain over time. And that's where we come in to help explain nature's wrath. Tonight, we take an in-depth look at the science behind what allows these storms to become so powerful, the forces that guide them on the paths that they take and the type of destruction they can cause. But it all begins with what allows these storms to form in the first place. As we look into how hurricanes form, we need to first look at the global forces that can determine whether we'll see a busy or quiet hurricane season. We're talking about three ocean patterns that can each act as an on or off switch that can help create or kill a brewing storm. First, the El Nino Southern Oscillation's two phases, El Nino and La Nina. Both of these affect sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean, which then alters wind strength blowing into the Atlantic. During El Nino years, the sea surface temperatures near the equal equator are generally warmer than average. That creates stronger winds in the Atlantic, which can then shear the tops of hurricanes, making it harder for them to form and strengthen. On the other hand, during La Nina years, the water is cooler, which means lighter winds, allowing hurricanes to grow stronger. Next, we head to the North Atlantic Oscillation. This is a weather phenomenon that controls the strength and direction of westerly winds. At play, here is the low atmospheric pressure near Iceland and the high pressure near the Azores Islands. When the difference between them is lower than average, the winds are weaker, meaning hurricanes are more likely to form. When the two pressure systems are more intense than average, wind conditions increase, making it harder for hurricanes to form. Now let's head further south and look at the Atlantic Meridional Mode, which determines sea surface temperatures, either warmer or cooler than average. When the area north of the equator is warmer than average, that gives hurricanes the energy they need to grow and intensify. When the same area is cooler, hurricanes are less likely to form. So bottom line, hurricanes love warm water to give them energy and light winds that won't interfere with their development. So when these three patterns work together to give them those conditions, we can expect a busy hurricane season. But cooler water in the Atlantic and strong winds lead to weaker storms and a quiet season. So what do conditions look like right now? We're currently El Nino Southern Oscillation neutral, meaning neither El Nino nor La Nina conditions exist. So no significant impact on storm development. But sea surface temperatures in the Eastern Atlantic are running above average, which could lead to an earlier Cape Verde season than we normally do and can lead to more storm formation. But those aren't the only factors when it comes to storm formation. Have you heard of SAL or the Saharan Air Layer? SAL is a dry air mass made up of dust, dirt, and sand that originates over the Saharan Desert in Africa. It can be as high as 20,000 feet. Remember the easterly trade winds? Well, they carry this across the Atlantic Ocean and they can make its way right up to Texas to, of course, irritate our allergies. However, when talking hurricanes or possible storm formation, it can limit the strength of a cyclone. Basically, it shears itself apart. Dust transports itself during the summer months, which is the same as hurricane season, so it can limit storm activity across the Atlantic. Once a hurricane does form, you've noticed they spin counterclockwise like a record. 
That has everything to do with something called the Coriolis effect. And that has everything to do with the fact that our planet Earth is a huge rotating sphere. That means objects near the center or equator of the planet are moving much faster than objects near the top or North Pole. Now, throw a ball from the equator toward the north. Because the ball maintains its higher velocity, as the planet's rotational velocity slows underneath it, the ball appears to bend off to the right. Same thing for a ball moving north to south. Earth's velocity increases under the moving ball, and it appears to bend off to the right. The same goes for moving air. When low pressure forms, that low wants to pull air toward it in a straight line. But the Coriolis force, it wants to bend that air off to the right. The result, the air spins around the center of low pressure in a counterclockwise direction. And that is why hurricanes spin in the first place, because of the Coriolis effect. When we discuss tropical systems and their movement across the Atlantic Basin, we have to discuss one large semi-permanent atmospheric feature that plays a big role in where these systems go and also their intensity as they make their journey across the Atlantic Ocean. For that, we go out towards the island nation of Bermuda, where we find this very large semi-permanent air mass called the Bermuda High that it borrows its name from the island nation that it's typically found over. As we go through the next several scenarios, we'll break down where these systems could potentially go as they make their journey westward. With scenario one, we have a system moving on in towards the east coast. It's going to be coming out from the Atlantic Ocean, and it's going to make its way through portions of the Bahama Islands and then heading on up towards the east coast. As it goes towards the east coast, we could see potentially states like Georgia, the Carolinas, and even the northeast potentially impacted from either a direct landfall or maybe just a glancing blow. Now let's discuss scenario two, which allows the system, this Bermuda high pressure system to be stretched out in more of an egg-like shape right there as it really moves across in towards the East Coast covering several of the Eastern United States. As we watch this system right here, this tropical system makes its journey westward. It'll go over island nations like the U.S. Virgin Islands, the island nation of Haiti and Dominican Republic, Cuba, and even towards the Bahamas. Also, it will go right in through perhaps portions of the southern state of Florida. And after that, once it survives that journey, it gets in towards the northeastern section of the Gulf of Mexico. Now we can see states like Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle impacted by a direct landfall from a tropical depression, storm, or even a hurricane. Now with scenario three, we discuss how that tropical system right there could potentially be steered into the Gulf of Mexico because the Bermuda High is much, much bigger. Now it stretches its legs all the way across portions of the East Coast and the Southeast going as far west as the Mississippi River Valley area. Once we watch this tropical system make its way through the Caribbean Sea, it could impact several nations along the way, out towards the Haiti, Dominican Republic area, up through Cuba. Then after that, if it survives that long journey, it will get into the Gulf of Mexico. Once it gets into the Gulf, it could possibly go through several different paths, taking it in towards Mexico, in towards Louisiana, Mississippi, but also take it right here, unfortunately, into portions of Texas, and it definitely includes us right here in the Houston metro area. That's why we must pay attention to the entire tropic season to see where that Bermuda high pressure is, because that may determine where tropical systems are steered and if one is being sent our way. Satellites, they give us the ability to look down on our planet and see things from an otherworldly perspective. From the first crude televised satellite image in 1960 to today's high resolution images from cameras hovering thousands of miles above our planet. It's the ability to look down on the oceans that has had the greatest impact on tropical meteorology in the past 100 years. This bird's eye view gives us information about developing storm structure, intensity, the environment it's moving into, changes in sea surface temperature, all from a very safe distance. Now that being said, there is no replacing piercing into the center of an approaching storm to gather first-hand data. So once a storm like this gets into range, the hurricane hunters fly. When we come back, we fly into the eye of the storm.